Ο ραδιοφωνικός σταθμός του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου είναι γεγονός. UCY Voice 95,2 Φοιτητική ζωή Ακαδημαϊκά θέματα Ενημέρωση Και πολλή μουσική Όλα στον πιο φοιτητικό σταθμό της πόλης UCY Voice 95,2 Η δική σου φωνή Καλημέρα Σήμερα θα έχουμε τη χαρά να κάνουμε μια συνέντευξη σε έναν επίτιμο προσκεκλημένο μας τον καθηγητή κύριο Νίκ Τάιλερ από το UCL ε, Την συνέντευξη θα την πάρουμε η κυρία Κατερίνα Σιλιανού που είναι ερευνητική συνεργάτητα στο Εργαστήριο Συγκοινωνιακής Μηχανικής η κυρία Ξένια Καρακλά η οποία είναι επίσης η δόκτωρα Ξένια Καρακλά η οποία είναι επιστημονική συνεργάτητα στο Πανεπιστήμιο UCL και από εμένα, ο οποίο είμαι ο Λουκά Δημητρίου και είμαι ο διευθυντή του Εργαστηρίου Συγκοινωνιακή Μηχανική στο Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου. Ε, η συνέντευξη θα γίνει στα αγγλικά, μια και ο προσκεκλημένο μα είναι προφανώ Άγγλο. Ε, ε, Όμω θα φροντίσουμε οι έννοιε και ό,τι συζητήσουμε να είναι απλά δοσμένε. So, Professor uh, Nick Tyler is the Chandwick Professor of Transportation and Civil Engineering in the Department of Civil Engineering in the UCL. Uh, he is a very experienced scholar, educator, and researcher with uh, extensive uh, experience from projects and cases uh, from around the world. Uh, he is uh, a collaborator of uh, us, of our university, and we, have, uh, we are honored to have him with us. So, Professor, I would uh, like to have a light discussion with you about the profession of uh, transportation engineering and I would like to have your views and your insights about the future, the past, the present, and the future of transportation engineering. So, would you be kind enough to give us what is the discipline of transportation engineering and how it has been evolved and which scientific areas uh, it involves? Well, good morning. Um, transportation engineering, I guess, has a history um, going back maybe a few thousand years, really, because uh, when people had to start to move, we had to work out how they could move. And as soon as you start to construct things for that, you're into transportation engineering. So a large element of it, I guess, historically has been around civil engineering, or what we would now call civil engineering, creating the infrastructure Uh, on which things move or by which things move. But it also involves bits of mechanical engineering about how we actually do the moving. Um, it involves these days more electronics, um, computing. Um, but I think essentially we need to think about what we really mean by engineering because all of that hardware stuff and system stuff is is really crucially important but only because it's serving a purpose so we need to include in our concept of transportation engineering why it is people are moving how they're moving um, what they're trying to move for um, in some cases what they're trying to move in terms of objects and things um, so that brings in things like um, psychology it brings in things like Um, the biomechanics of people, it brings in um, philosophy, it uh, brings in economics, uh, mathematics. So these, these other kinds of sciences um, all come together in the concept of how a person moves around a city or around the planet. Um, and you can't really leave any of them out We need, because you can't do the hard engineering without having done the, the so-called software engineering piece first. So for me, The key word is, is engineering. Engineering means um, ingenuity. Um, the first person with the title of engineer was Leonardo da Vinci. And really? He, yes. We Greeks, uh, we yes. believe that we, we were the first no, no, engineers. No, 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 I didn't say the first engineers. I said the first the person with the title. Ah, engineer, okay. right? And he was called the general engineer. Mm. And um, But I think... <coughs> The, the concept of 
uh, what, what Leonardo da Vinci was really on about was this sense of ingenuity of being being smart in in the in the proper sense of the word. So so how do I solve a problem? How do I how do I figure out what the problem is and how do I solve it? That's sort of engineering to me. And I think long before Leonardo da Vinci, the Greeks, the Egyptians and historically were doing very very significant in engineering activity. And I think the the transportation part of that is simply how that relates to movement. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that uh, transportation engineering in uh, particular is a fundamental science or an applied science or a mixture of those two? Or because as mm. far as I can see and I can tell, uh, you're more uh, you're equally philosopher and uh, <laughs> applied scientist. I think, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, science is just knowledge. Mm. Um, I think I'm more interested in wisdom than knowledge. I think so. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so, transportation engineering is it? Is it a, a basic science? I think. I think it's a. It's. It's the conjunction of a lot of basic sciences, um, and how you combine lots of different sciences can. I mean, I think possibly is actually a basic science of its own. Mm. So it's a sort of science of sciences, if you like. And and so in that sense, it's a fundamental science. On the other hand, we have trains and buses going around, uh, which is pretty applied. So so I think the magic thing, it, to me, and why it's exciting, is because you have that mix of being super fundamental. You know, there's some really fundamental theoretical insights to have every day, mm. and yet you have an application of it to test that. And and it's really wonderful. I go around the world. I walk down the street, and I, I'm doing fundamental science, walking down the street and applying it at the same time. And I think that's rather fun. <laughs> so, uh, which, under that perspective, which uh, do you think that uh, the main tools that the contemporary or a future transportation engineer should have, and how she or he should be prepared, and how she or he should be equipped? Oh. It seems a lot of complicated things all together. I think that's a good description of transport. <laughs> 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 um, and so your transport engineer has to be ingenious mm -hmm. in doing that. So what, how d what does it actually involve? Um, what does it actually involve is a um, matter of putting uh, those things together in innovative and ingenious ways. So that's important. And the question of uh, how we equip people to do that. Well, you have trained uh, transportation engineers for yeah. more than 30 years, I guess. Yeah, that's a bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think, and I think it's changed in that time. Mm. I think 30 years ago, we were educating transport engineers to do equations, mm. um, to do calculations. There was a sort of series of things they had to learn to do, and you went out, you, they passed an exam, and you sent them into the world, and the employer expected them to be able to do those calculations and so on. Now, I don't think that's true. I think um, equations are um, actually quite a small part of what what's involved. Um, I think they have to understand the, the, the calculations, have to understand um, what those calculations are throwing out mm -hmm, in terms of mm -hmm. answers. But actually doing them, I think, is less less of an issue um, because mm -hmm. there's there's you know, the computing power now compared with the computing power 30 years ago for example is huge and mm -hmm. you know, why would I bother to work out if I can actually practice to do a, an equation um, by hand why would I do that I mean I think understanding what that equation is doing which might involve doing it by hand to sort of see it through the the phases of, of it or something like that um, yes, but actually practicing doing it, I don't think so. So uh, why ask a student to reproduce it in an exam? You know, I'm, uh, I think um, what I might be more interested in is saying to a student, um, can you, if, if, this is, if this is the answer that you're given, how, import, how good is that answer? What does it mean? Mm. That is a much more important thing. And I think transportation engineers have shifted from being what I would call 
um, a sort of technical technician mechanic type approach um, you know, sort of doing calculations with deterministic outcomes into being a much more um, psychological interpretative um, skill of saying when I when I look at these answers this is telling me that this that so and so is happening and therefore we need to be doing something about it that kind of skill and that's a very different kind of processing absolutely yes and so how uh, you see the contribution of uh, your students or uh, in general the transportation engineer in society or uh, and uh, in industry how do you see what kind of uh, tools and what kind of views uh, should the transportation in engineer contribute to the uh, society well i think they should contribute to making society better <laughs> sure <laughs> i think that is crucial okay. now, and and actually that's quite hard because you know uh, if you when you turn the key on your on a car you to start the car you are polluting the atmosphere mhm mm that's the way it is i don't want to but uh, no, no, but that's what happens you, know, you you you've got lots of other reasons for driving the car but that is a fundamental thing so actually transportation engineers are kind of doing harm mm -hmm. so if you're starting from that point how do we do less harm uh, is by having a much more responsible view about um, how we can minimize the harm that we're doing so how can we minimize the number of times somebody has to has to uh, pollute, pollute? Um, that's just one example it's not just chemical pollution, noise pollution, you know, visual pollution and so on. Um, how can we minimize that and still manage to achieve the kind of quality of life that we would like a modern society to have? Mm -hmm. um, and that is, is almost an impossible equation. This, this, this does not work. You, know, you are going to pollute, you're going to do harm, you're going to give benefit, but how can you actually get those two things aligned in a way that makes it actually a civilized future society um, and that's very different for a transportation engineer compared with say I don't know um, um, a medical doctor for example who, who whose propensity to do harm is relatively small yeah. it's not zero but it's small and generally they are doing good things um, for a transportation engineer you know, we, like, we certainly like to do good things I and mean, we should be well educated and well trained to do good things but we do have this slight technical problem in the background that mm -hmm. we are actually doing harm in the first place so uh, what's your vision for future societies like if you were to describe the ideal society of the future what would that involve I think it would involve um, what I would call sociability, I think, is, is for people to interact with each other. And the human species is a social species. We, we, um, we ever since we came out of caves, or even when we went into caves, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, we, w it's a social species. We do things together. Mm -hmm. And maybe one of the fractures in society is when that stops happening. And people start to go, on their own and they, s and they develop independently of each other and then you start to find they, they conflict. So if we want to have um, a quality society I think one of the things you have to be able to do is to interact and talk and that means uh, people have to come together so transport is a part of that um, but it means also that, that uh, they have to be able to come together in a reasonable environment where you can have that kind of conversation so you know the, the you know the, the peak hour London underground train or Tokyo metro train or Beijing metro train is not a place where you can do that because it's it's overdone it's sort of hyper dense um, and therefore that that kind of fails so for me a future society is a society in which it is comfortable for people to be able to um, to come together in that sort of social way. And technology nowadays is not really doing that. It's taking people apart 
connecting them in some ways, yeah. but actually taking them apart in other ways. Yes, it's, yeah. it's a bit of an illusion, isn't it? I mean, um, I watch people, I can tell when people are listening to their iPods because they walk in a different way. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very sad I've watched these things. <laughs> 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 um, but, they, but and also, I know somebody, we did some experiments in the lab and, uh, where we had people with mobile phones and the mobile phone, when, they, when we text them on the mobile phone, when they're walking along, they drop their speed by 25% straight away. It's the first thing that happens. And then they become less and less aware of the environment around them mm. until they're barely conscious of what is actually around them. Um, and that is becoming a real problem in reality. I mean, in Germany, they had so many pedestrian accidents because yeah. people uh, looking at their mobile phone walking into the street that they have put signals on the ground mm. uh, traffic light signals for them on the ground so that they can see them um, and that seems to me so one level the mobile phone is what are they doing they're communicating with somebody mm -hmm. that is true but actually uh, are they socialising with them in that and I don't mean having a party I mean socialising in the sense of having a full interaction I don't think so they're having Body language a very partial and yes because communication isn't simply voice yeah uh, it's or words or yeah exactly it's it's gesture it's mm -hmm. uh, figuring out it's the sort of micro signals Body that posture. we emit all the time that that um, that you know if somebody is listening or not yeah. and how do we know that and nobody can tell me how we know that but we do know when we film somebody um, at a thousand frames per second we can begin to see some of these little slight tiny little signals um, that are sort of coming through of how somebody is actually um, feeling, for example. Um, that's very different if you meet somebody in person than if you speak to them even on a, a something like Skype, for mm -hmm. example, where you can, in theory, see them on a good day um, and hear them. It's not the same as actually meeting them in, in, Absolutely. in person. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really important that we have that social piece, I think. So, uh, which are, do you think are the main trends or problems or requirements or projects uh, globally uh, related to transportation engineering and civil engineering, possibly? Ooh. Well, I suppose the, f the principal one is that uh, moving people mm -hmm. um, and things. I mean, we mustn't forget things. Um, we need to move food, mm -hmm. for example, uh, water. Um, but if you look at moving people, um, how do we move large numbers of people is complicated. So London, for example, the central area of London has two and a half million people in it during the day, more than they have in the evening. So those two and a half million people have to get into the centre of London in an hour, hour and a half or something like that in the morning and out in a couple of hours in the afternoon. How do you do that? Well, of course, that's massive investment. Look at the London mm -hmm. Underground Network, look at the London Bus Network, look at the rail network coming into London. There's a massive uh, pile of infrastructure uh, it, simply to do that. And I can't help thinking that's a very stupid solution. <laughs> so part of uh, where transportation engineering and civil engineering as part of transportation yep. engineering um, comes into play, I think, is is why are we actually doing that? Why why aren't we actually distributing the economy of London around the city more and then figuring out the movement of people not to have to come into the centre but be able to move around the city a lot a lot more easily? And that to me is a fairly basic piece of engineering, but but it starts by asking the first question of what is it you want to do and where before you start building the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, London, like most um, uh, existing cities, but London was early on the game, so it sort of may be worse than some, um, thought that the answer was to bring everybody into London. So you have this hugely radial network, um, which makes it very easy to come into the centre, but very hard to move around mm. the periphery. And we know where we do make it easier to move around the periphery, it, it has a transformative effect <coughs> on economy, and on the need for people to have to travel into the centre to um, to do work or to meet people and so on. So I think if I were looking in the future, I would say we should be looking much, much more at, or spending much more time thinking about 
what is a better thing for society in terms of distributing the benefits of economic wealth, for example, mm-hmm. but not, but also the ability to socialise, um, isn't done. It, two and a half million people don't socialise. Four or five people socialise. Mm. So you have to get it into the into the world. So how do we actually get those two and a half million people to socialise in groups of four or five or whatever, you know, smaller numbers? And that means distribution. And so transport creating, can do that. Creating smaller centres, basically, yeah. around a city. Yeah, there's a very sort of polycentric sort of idea um, where it becomes much easier to do things locally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think technology is actually helping that. So because because you know, a hundred years. One of the reasons that they wanted to bring everybody into the centre was that's where things happen. That's where the power, the energy was. You know, the mm-hmm. the steam power, or the water power, or whatever it was. That was concentrated in one place. But if you, but now we have a much more distributed energy and power system. Now you have much more distributed technology you don't even need to be connected to a wall to to run a computer now yeah. so you can you can work anywhere and you know if you go to any you know coffee bar i reckon in europe and possibly much wider afield around the world you will see people sitting there with a computer working so the coffee bar is becoming the working place mm-hmm. and it's sort of interesting because 300 years ago the coffee bar was the working place in London, for example, that's how the whole financial sector grew, mm-hmm. um, and and so it's sort of kind of reverting back. It's, it's so, as if it's sort of we've got a technology now that is enabling us to become more human at one level because we're able to do that kind of conversing and and managing around small groups of people while we are actually uh, dealing with many people internationally all at the same time, and that's a really really great thing. So, so the technology of itself can have different effects in terms of that social connection. One is a very isolating one that I'm sitting here looking at my computer and nothing else. And the other one is, but actually at the same time, I'm sitting in a cafe with lots of other people doing things. And some branches of Starbucks I've noticed, not that I ever go in Starbucks except in, in Tokyo. There's one, there's one Starbucks in Tokyo which I will permit myself to go into <laughs> so I can watch a pedestrian crossing. Um, <laughs> is, is interesting because they are, I saw one that, that is essentially you don't buy coffee in Starbucks. You what you pay for is the space. The you, so you say, I, I will be <coughs> here for three hours, and you have the Wi-Fi and help, and they will just bring you coffee. Mm-hmm. And the, so, so because your value as a customer is the time you're spending there, not necessarily the buying of the coffee. So, and people are using it like an office. So um, everything can be an office. Yeah, basically, a bus. I, I do a lot of my emails on the bus, you know, and, and, and I think it seems appropriate. It, it's it's a way of doing stuff, and I think that has freed has been very very much a sort of freedom generating thing um, on the other hand the fact that I have so many emails that I have to do them on the bus maybe is not a liberating thing mm-hmm. yeah it's another having said another that husband, yeah. you are leading uh, uh, an accessibility lab mm. uh, could you please describe us uh, your activities there and how you are involved in uh, um, in that context that you uh, described us Okay, so um, accessibility uh, for me is about how you reach doing something. So how do we research that and how do we enable people to um, uh, get to where they need to do to do what they want to do and so on. Um, And one of the markers for that is going to be um, how people who have difficulties moving around do that. So it's it's a, it's, um, a good thing to do to study how, for example, somebody in a wheelchair manages to get from one place to another. Um, I realized a few years ago that actually we don't really understand how that happens. Um, so thinking about how, so how would I understand how, well let's build a piece of infrastructure and see how people in wheelchairs um, maneuver around it. And then what happens if I change it a bit and twist it about and put a slope on it and things like that then I can start to see that and we can do the same thing of course not only for people in wheelchairs we can talk about um, people with vision um, 
differences in the way that they see. We have people with different hearing capabilities, um, people with different cognitive capabilities. And the advantage of having a laboratory, just like in a chemistry laboratory, mm -hmm. where you can control the circumstances and then you can test what happens when you when you change something is exactly the same here. The difference between this laboratory and a chemistry laboratory is it's a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so it's important that it is a life scale thing. It's important that somebody going into this laboratory believes that they're in um, a real environment in the in the world, even though it's laced with instruments and meters and cameras and things. They have to feel that it's in 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 the world. So we create um, a laboratory that gives us that flexibility mm -hmm. to do that. And from that, we can then learn what happens to people who do not have those capability mm -hmm. differences. And now, uh, sorry. Um, Working with you for the past seven years, I know that you see the world in you a completely... I <laughs> did survive. Uh, I know that you see the world in a completely different way than others do. You like pushing the boundaries, you like bringing disciplines together and everything. Where do you find your inspiration? What makes you see problems in the society that others do not see? And then how do you break them down into making them experiments, for example, or mm. measurable things? Um, Tricky question. Is there one <laughs> Obviously, learned very well. Yes. One million <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Leonardo da Vinci said that um, you should always be curious. You should always look at um, the ashes in the fire, the stains on the wall, clouds in the sky, and see what they are, what, well just what, just look at them as if they are curious things, and how you can learn from them, also what do they represent to you, are they a pattern, are they a, um, uh, evidence of something, or whatever. And, and I think that as a concept is interesting, because it always makes you look at everything new. So everything, in one level, everything is a bit of a surprise. Everything is a curiosity. So I always want to unwrap things and have a look inside and see what they're, see what they're um, actually doing. So I think that sense of curiosity is, is really important. And that means if you pull things apart like that, you have to start looking at what's inside. And therefore, what do I understand? Well, I, I'm not a neurologist, so I don't, under I don't know how the brain works. Um, but I know people who do, mm -hmm. so I go to them and say, "How does this happen? You know, how do we how do we manage to see this or hear that? Um, how does that work?" And then we start to realise that actually they don't know either. What they know is um, some very hugely important but tiny detail of how neurons fire and or where they fire or whatever in the brain, and therefore. Um, we can start to put that together and when I challenge them to do things differently from their own kind of approaches to the science then they start to learn new things too so of course the great thing is when everybody comes out of this learning um, and that's how you push the frontiers so basically what I get from that is that a single discipline cannot answer all the questions of the discipline but even bringing teaming up with other people from other disciplines is still sometimes hard, like it needs work yeah, yeah, to yeah, answer sure. Absolutely. questions. I mean, I mean because so people look at things in different ways. So, uh, interesting example, we do a lot of work with ophthalmology. So how people see the environment, that's where I came from, how do people see the environment? Mm -hmm. um, so ophthalmologists come along and they have lots of research on how people see, but actually their research is on how the eye works. And they don't really think about what people see. So they know they know that the eye, the lens on the eye, is is maybe a bit stiffer than it should be, or it's a bit out of focus, and etc. And all of those, or there's something wrong with the retina. They will know all those things, but what that means in terms of what you see when you walk down the street, and therefore whether you miss a um, uh, an obstacle or not, that's sort of outside their thing. So one of the pieces of kit that they use is is called an eye tracker. Mm -hmm. And an eye tracker um, takes advantage of the fact that your eyes are never still. Your eyes are always in, in, in motion. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like 
um, and this is a very, very simplistic way of describing it, but if you imagine taking a photograph of a scene and then moving the camera a bit and taking another photograph and moving it somewhere else and taking another photograph and then you go home and you stick all these photographs together, get Photoshop out and you join all the photographs together and you have an image of, this, of that whole scene. Yeah. Right? Your eye is doing that maybe 60 times a second. And and the you don't know that your eyes are moving around because when they move around, it switches off. If you drink too much, the synchronisation goes a bit. So you'll th that's why things sort of wander about a bit in your vision. Um, and because uh, you've sort of lost that synchronisation and you're not used to the eyes moving around like that. So it sort of... Uh, unless you do it very often, of course. But... Um, but so what we can do is we can follow the eye so we have a machine called the eye tracker which follows the eye moving uh, and and of course the eye does stop it stops and to take the photograph so so it tracks where your eye moves and how long it stops for and everything which and, we direction, can, yeah. and which yeah. direction it's looking mm -hmm. at and so on and you can superimpose that on an image of what you're actually looking at Mm -hmm. So, so on the computer screen, you will see an image, let's say, of, of this room, and a little cursor in it, which is where your eye is looking in the room. And we can follow that cursor running about the screen, and um, that is from the ophthalmologist's point of view. They are very interested in how the eye moves, so they look at the movement from one point to another, and they see how effective that is, and they measure it, and they time it, and they see are there parts of the visual field that the eye never goes to and all those sorts of things. From my perspective I'm less interested in in that mm. and then I'm as where they stop. Because where the eye stops is actually interesting to me because it's not um, it's not scanning like a television screen or like a computer camera, like a video camera. It's It's taking points out of the scene and stopping on them. Mm -hmm. And so we can count, for example, the number of times it stops on a particular that it identifies object. something. Yeah. And yeah. there's something going on. So th that says, I'm walking along and, and, and I see some obstacle in front of me, and you'll see the eye stop on it, and it'll go off and it'll look all over the place, and it'll come back and look at this. So you can start to see where there are priorities, let's say, mm. for paying attention. Like a step or like a. Like a step or an obstacle or something. Yeah. You know. um, and by looking at that, we can say that's starting to tell us what what the person is thinking is important. And we can study all sorts of things as a result of that. But we have these two very different perspectives of using the same piece of kit. Mm -hmm. and Between disciplines. From, from the yeah. ophthalm ophthalmology yeah. and, and whatever I am, looking at that piece of kit is, is a completely different perspective. And, and each surprise the other. So now the ophthalmologists are going off looking at where the eye stops mm -hmm. um, and what that sequence is. So we have shifted ophthalmology a little bit um, and and also of course shifted ourselves a huge amount because that's starting to tell us, give us a lot of information and that got me to ask why does the eye stop on these things particularly I can understand having decided that there is a step in the path for example I can understand why it would think that's important and needs to keep checking it what I don't understand is why it stopped the first time is it random is there something driving that? What is actually driving that? And that has to be the brain. So I went and found some neurologists and say, how does the brain decide where the eye is going to stop the first time? And they said, what eye? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> they just do neurons. Yeah. So, so, so we had to sort of uh, get them to understand the kind of problem that we were talking about. And then they started to think, well, this is quite interesting. I wonder what happens to the brain when you go walking about. And let's see, let's see those things. So neurology shifts a bit. You know, yeah. But actually, what I'm talking about is how somebody walks down the road and gets on a bus. And I think bringing those things together mm -hmm. is something how um, we've gone into a world, I think, where we divide everything up into these ever-decreasing disciplines, and mm -hmm. they're ever fine, more finely described um, disciplines. And you, it's very easy to lose the connection with everything else. So somebody has to put that Together. back together mm -hmm. again and I think that's sort of kind of what we do really and it happens to be that one of the places where humans put all that stuff together again in a very complex way yeah. is actually um, the business of moving around and so transport becomes a, a natural home for that 
Um, and then you're able to identify differences between genders, between age groups and everything. Yeah. So therefore you design a better society for all. That's, that's kind of the idea. Essentially what yeah. is. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the idea. But, but you, we need to understand what happens at the limits to know what you can actually do at the center, if you sort of mean. So, so how does um, how does a person with dementia see, for example? Very few people, until very recently, nobody knew, nobody even thought about how a person with dementia sees, because um, by the time th their vision is being affected by the dementia, they've lost a lot of other capability. So, um, the question of how what they can see is not really wasn't of interest and then somebody began to get interested in this and they started to look at a form of dementia it's quite rare but it's a form of dementia which works it's a little bit like um, Alzheimer's disease um, Alzheimer's disease essentially um, sort of destroys the brain basically I mean again very very mm -hmm. simplistically and it starts generally from the front of the brain and moves to the back Okay. So it starts by you you start losing behavior, you start losing sort of long uh, short term memory, you start losing the ability to communicate you, and, and so on. And by the time it gets to the back, that's where your vision is in the brain. So so this particular variant of that does it the other way around. So the, the, the mechanism is the same, but it just get, does it backwards. So one of the first things to be affected is the vision. Mm -hmm. So by looking at people like that, it's very interesting. Um, if I held my hand up and say, could you touch my hand, they would just look extremely vague. They wouldn't know what on earth I was talking about. If I um, took them to a badminton court and we played badminton, they would play badminton quite happily. Mm, interesting. Right? Until the shuttlecock sits on the floor. And as soon as the shuttlecock stops moving, they're completely confused. They lose the mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. um, they could look at your face, they would see eyes, they would see nose, they'd see mouth, etc. All of the characteristics of the face, but they could not put it together mm -hmm. as one object. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they, you, if I show them a cup, I hold a cup up, and they'll say, I say, what is this? And they'll say, I wave it around a bit, and they'll say, oh, well, that's a cup. Okay, if I turn, just simply turn the cup on its side, they wouldn't recognize it. So those kinds of perceptual things is what's going on there. So how does that affect them walking about? Well, they get very, it means they pay, they seem to pay more attention to shadows than normally people would. Um, so their peripheral vision is, is, they're not somehow differentiating between the different parts of their vision. Um, they seem to have an issue around um, sequences of instructions. So you can give them one instruction and that's sort of fairly okay. You can give them two and that's a bit okay. But give them three and they can't start doing the first one. Yeah. So so if I want somebody with dementia to live in our future society, a very sociable society, why shouldn't somebody with dementia live in that society? Um, I've got to figure out how do we actually enable them to navigate mm -hmm. when they can only receive information in a fairly limited sequence. So basically um, when, when we design public transport systems, um, squares or whatever we design, we need to take into account every single group that would use this society. I, I, I remember a project that we did that um, we were trying to reduce the, um, the height between the platform and the train. Uh, in order for wheelchair users to go on the train quicker, but then this afterwards created a problem for older people because uh, they were tripping over. Do I remember right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So we focus on one group, but then we created actually yep. another problem to another yep. group, yep. which needed to yep. be investigated. Yes, yeah. that's right. And so. Um, London Underground brought some new trains in where they reduced the height of the floor and they had six times as many people tripping over as they went in into the train. Um, and they put some lights on and that went up to ten times. So, okay. so it was all a bit of a big problem. And uh, so why? Why was that? Well, uh, right now, I'm not sure we know. We have a, I have a pretty good idea why it is. We need to, to prove it. And essentially, um, I think it's because when you're getting on a train, 
like an underground, like a metro train, you're actually looking inside the carriage. So your eyes are essentially going, if you like, pointing horizontally. And you know, one and a half metres below that is this slight bump, mm. slight difference in floor. But it's, it's very poorly um, differentiated. So the colour of the floor of the train and the colour of the platform are not that different. And so um, y- you're looking at that. Because you're looking horizontally, you're actually looking if you're looking at that at all, it's going to be in the part of the vision which is incredibly poor quality, very bad at colour. Um, it's quite good at movement, but not good at much else. Um, and your attention is all about where, you, where you're going to go. And this sort of kind of s- subliminal signals from what somebody in front of you is doing, for example. If you see the person in front of you going up, you will expect to do the same. Uh, if you don't see that because it's n- the, d- the height is so small, mm-hmm. you have no signal, so you don't pick your foot up. And we're talking about three or four millimetres. millimetres yeah. So you don't pick your foot up three or four millimetres, and so you, you make a, a slight trip. These are not crashing trips that are going to totally fail, mm. but they, they might. But they, but they are going to alter your balance, alter your posture and so on. And so you, you lose balance and you have to recover, and most people can recover, not everybody. So doing something for the wheelchairs creates, a, as you say, creates a problem for somebody else, which we then have to solve. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean don't do it for the wheelchair. Of people. course. Yeah. It means we have to understand more. But what is important in that story, so it's really good of you to bring it up, is, is the problem is not the physical height of the floor. That is clearly not the problem. The problem is vision. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to look at this problem and say, not what is the, the immediate thing that's going wrong, but what actually are the steps behind that that are actually doing it that we can start to look at it and see how it's working. So how do we deal with the vision angle of this is, is really where we have to start, start looking at, at solving that kind of problem. These kinds of problems will be, I guess, uh, more thoroughly investigated in the new uh, laboratory no. that you're yes. trying to... Uh, uh, to build, uh, which will be called Pearl. Yes, Pearl. Could yes, you please yes. tell us uh, a few things about it? Pearl. Yes, the grit in the oyster. <laughs> yeah. <is> the pearl. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so Pearl is uh, is a person environment activity research laboratory, um, and those three things are really really important. Is it British? Is it European? Is yes, international it's centre? It's funded as part of a UK government um, <coughs> program to. Uh, research future infrastructure and that that program consists of 11 new university laboratories distributed around um, actually I think it's 15 universities some of them are sharing Mm -hmm. um, around the country and there will be things like railway engineering uh, ground engineering materials sensors big data stuff like that and the only one of these these 11 laboratories that actually looks at people is this one and um, it's a minority I guess well people (laughs) 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 Um, well most of the engineers are much happier (laughs) playing with (laughs) (laughs) with (laughs) people (laughs) I'm afraid to say but I like working with people so so we have people and actually most of those other things if, if they develop some new material um, in another university, they and they need to test it with people. They have to come to this one to do it, which is why it's really important that at least one of them mm-hmm. had uh, had this capability. Um, so it's part of this very very large program, and um, that is like a very much larger version of the one that we have now. Um, so at the moment, we can build one train carriage mm-hmm. uh, and a bit of station. Uh, to do the sort of work Senny was uh, describing. Uh, we've built a Boeing 777, mm. sort of a Boeing 777 to look at people getting on it in wheelchairs. Um, so we can do things like that. The new one, we will be able to have um, four carriages. We'll be able to have, say, two carriages on either side of an island platform so we can look at the inter- interaction of people dealing with trains in two directions, which is quite a big problem. Um, in some of the London Underground network, but actually elsewhere, uh, has that sort of problem. It will be international territory, as you said, right? It will be absolutely international territory. You have to have a visa to, <laughs> to go there. Um, the 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 idea is this is a this is a unique kind of facility. Um, so uh, there isn't anything like the one 
that we have at the moment in the mm -hmm. world. This is just that on sort of speed, really. It's, it's, it's um, if you imagine a space about 100 metres long, uh, about 40 metres wide, 10 metres high, that we can reconfigure in any form that we want. So we have a project to go in there where we're going to build 60 metres of street, full-size street, because we want to understand how people, how we can light a zebra crossing to be better. So we do the pedestrian side of that because that's people scale. So we will build a street with shops and curbs and two-way street, uh, put a zebra crossing in it, um, and then try different ways of lighting it because we can control the lighting. Um, we can put noise distractions in there so we can change the way the traffic sounds. We can put a music shop there with lots of music or, or cafe or whatever. Um, and in parallel, uh, uh, University of Sheffield will look at how the driver sees the pedestrian. They have a driving simulator that they can mm. do that in. And then we do these two things together. Um, then we can make the lab into a, a theatre. So we can pop it up as a theatre. And then you can start to show people like regulators, people like municipalities, people like government, uh, what's the difference. And instead of them having to read loads of papers which all talk about um, lux and colour and frequencies and wavelengths and things like that, this is now going to say, that's what it looks like. If I make it a bit pinker, it'll look like this. If I change the angle, it'll look like that. Which one should we do? And part of the idea is actually to reduce the time frame from fundamental research in the laboratory about lighting angles or lighting colour, etc., into what we do on the street to save lives from, at the moment, that would take, I think, past experience, maybe 25 years. Mm. Uh, I think we can get that down to probably three or four mm -hmm. because we can just cut an awful lot of the stuff out by simply being able to show people, demonstrate it, before you go actually onto the street where you are actually putting something down. You want to be really sure that what goes on the street is safe. And you might have different versions of how it is safe, that's fine, but it should be safe uh, before you put it on the street and put people at risk. Um, and we can do that uh, because we also have a project with, with a, a new town that is being built which is designed to be healthy. So we have like a in addition to our big laboratory inside where we control yep. pretty much everything about the environment we also have an outside one that we can do where we can't control very much about the environment but we can control what we're doing so professor uh, we thank you so much uh, this was uh, professor nick tyler from ucl and uh, uh, quoting from your twitter account nick tyler a thinker <laughs> <laughs> Yes, why voice 95.2 Ο ραδιοφωνικός σταθμός του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου